So we're going to read from verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John saith Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again the next day after John stood, and two of his disciples, looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. Amen. Ending a reading there. And may the Holy Ghost come upon us. Let's pray just for a moment or two. Our God, we confess at times we come to verses that expose in our own hearts our sense of weakness. We know we ought always to sense our weakness, but at times we just feel it that little bit more. And we feel a little like that tonight when we come to this particular portion of thy word. We rest not in the arm of flesh. We seek, O God, to make it clear and to make thy word clear. We pray that understanding will be gifted to each one, that the Holy Ghost will give us understanding, that none of us will be blind. We pray, Father, that thou wilt just help this preacher, therefore, to declare thy truth with power and authority in a manner that is fitting, in a manner that magnifies Christ, and that there may be signs following. We pray for salvation. O oh God, would you not save here tonight? Open up hearts. Melt them before thy presence. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that absolutely delighted me whenever I came here last August was walking into the church and almost immediately seeing the text that's above the door as we walk into this main building. Behold, the Lamb of God. And it delighted me because it's just one of those texts that thrills my heart. Many of our churches, I'm not too sure about North America, I think it's the same here as well as it is in Northern Ireland, but certainly in Northern Ireland there is a practice where possible of putting a text on the wall behind the preacher, one that stands there that everyone can see every time they come into God's house. And there are various texts that you'll find popping up in the churches quite frequently. Uh, for example, we, we find we preach Christ crucified is a very common one in our churches. And you can understand why. It is a reminder of the theme of our preaching, the content of our preaching, the purpose of our preaching is to preach Christ and Him crucified. Others I can think of are justified by His blood. And then, of course, the text we have here, Behold the Lamb of God. And this particular text, I think, is perfect for its purpose. The reason being is that it calls each and every one who gathers into God's house every time it calls both saint and sinner to look upon the one that they are to feast upon. They are to behold Christ. That's their purpose for gathering. It's not to come to fellowship. It's not to come to have some material needs met. It is to come and behold the Lamb. It's to see Christ. It's to meet with Him. And the kind of command, the, the, the imperative that comes across with the word behold is what re really catches the heart. If it just said the Lamb of God, 
that would be nice and all, but it says, Behold, behold the Lamb of God. Look upon the Lamb of God. And whether or not you're coming into church for the first time or you're coming in for the 5,000th time, this is an appropriate message to behold the Lamb of God. In my home congregation, this is the text they have on the back wall, so maybe I'm a bit biased. Um, from the moment of my salvation, that's the text I looked upon hanging over the head of my minister there, printed on that wall, Behold the Lamb of God. And in 2005, our church engaged in a, a building of a new church. They were wondering whether or not to extend or to uh, build a new church. And I don't know what way the taxes work here, but over there, if you extend, you pay taxes. If you build a new building, you don't. So it almost works out more cost effective if the building's been up, especially for a considerable period of time, to pull it down and build a new one. And this is what the, the committee there decided to do. Now, in 2005, they're in the middle of the pulling down. It didn't open until uh, autumn or fall 2006. But 2005, they're pulling down the old building. And over the weekend, I think it was, certainly for a couple of days, they pulled down the front of the church. Maybe even the roof was off at this stage. Perhaps even one of the side walls. I don't know. What I do know is the back wall of the church was standing there exposed, facing the road where everyone passes by. So if you walk past or you drove past the big blue wall as we had it, the big blue wall with gold writing painted on the back of it, behold, the Lamb of God could be clearly seen every time you pass the church. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal is that God used it. There was a fairly young woman, perhaps in around 40 years of age at the time, who was walking past and looked upon the text and as she walked on, could not get the text out of her head and heart until very shortly after that, I don't know whether it was that night, I think if I recall we were conducting a, a gospel mission around that time and it may have been a couple of days later at the mission she came out and she came to Christ but the text that she observed, Behold the Lamb of God, was what initiated spiritual thoughts and spiritual concerns about her need for Christ. She had no real understanding about the gospel whatsoever. A young woman who later got cancer and is now in glory. And she looked at that text, beheld the Lamb of God, and was saved just a short time afterwards. What a powerful testimony how God uses the strangest of things. Certainly it wasn't the intent, I don't think, of the builders. Well, we'll just leave the back wall up there with the text as a witness. It's just the way it worked out, and God moves in mysterious ways. John the Baptist's one duty was to prepare the way for Christ. We thought about that. We've been thinking about that on frequent occasions in this study. And it was the only reason for his existence to prepare the way. It superseded Everything else he may have been identified as or with. We may have called him the son of Zacharias and Elizabeth. We may have called him or said that he was a Levitical priest. We may have said he was a Jew. All these things are right. But his calling to prepare the way for Jesus Christ superseded all of that. It became the singular purpose for his existence and if you said to John the Baptist, John, the only reason you exist is to prepare the way of the Lord, I don't think he would have been offended by that. That wouldn't have been an insult to him. Sometimes if we said to one another, the only reason you're here is because of X, Y, or Z, one thing, we might be offended that we only have one sole purpose upon the earth. But it wouldn't have offended John. John, if you said to him, John, the only reason you're here is to prepare the way for the Lord. John would have said, you're right, that's it, that is why I am here, the purpose of my existence, I am to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. His thoughts about Christ were predominantly on his work of atonement, not just on his person, that's clear as well, but on his work. And in dealing with the condemnation that hung upon sinners as he viewed them there in his day, his mind and ministry were not only Christward, they were crossword. And we must keep both of those in mind. 
There is a habit to not even get as far as that. Some of the material I read, some of the sermons I hear, I marvel at their emptiness with regard to the person of Jesus Christ. That theologically, in many ways, you can't find any error in it. There's no problem in it. They, they talk about God. They talk about the, you know, certain aspects of God and attributes of God and the love of God and the mercy of God. And, they, uh, and they're, they're, they're theocentric. They, 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 they drive us to think about God and marvels and good things and wonderful things that the Bible reveals about God. But they don't get the Christ. They miss Christ who is the image of the invisible God. In Him all fullness dwells. If we don't see Christ, we're missing it all. And much of what is preached at times is almost just, it's just like a Jewish sermon. It could, it could be found in a synagogue. Something about God and, and the truth about God. And you say, yes, it's all true, it's all fine. But it's not Christ-centered. It doesn't get to Christ. And then you have those who will get us to Christ, and they will point to Christ, but they don't get to the atonement. They don't get crossword. They don't get us to what He was here for and what He did on our behalf. And they miss all of that. And you know, beloved, that is not preaching right. We need to see Christ, and we need to see the work of Christ. The person, the work. Those things always need to be coming through in our sermons, in our messages, in what you listen to. Is it not Christ that feeds the soul? Is it not an image of Him that thrills your heart? I can fill you full of knowledge about theology that, uh, that is about God, and that has its place. I'm not saying it doesn't, but preaching that doesn't drive at the heart of the issue, doesn't focus us upon the second person of the Trinity and lead us into seeing Him, for He is the one set aside in the Trinity to reveal God. If we're missing that, we're missing everything. In a certain sense, that may be said, we're missing everything. It is Christ that melts our hearts. Seeing Him, and John understood that, he never got away from this. Behold the Lamb of God. There's the person. But don't forget the work that taketh away the sin of the world. And this is what he said to men. This is how he prepared the way. As the Lord Jesus was about to commence his ministry. And as I said this morning, what I want to do is just focus upon verse 29. I just want to, I don't, want to miss what is here and what we can learn from this text when it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And next week we might go on and even use this text and on the text, that, the verses rather that follow. But I just want us to focus here upon this verse and what, or some of the things rather we can learn from it. We're considering the Lamb of God. We're not trying to be fancy with the title. It's the Lamb of God. That's what the text declares. That's what the verse points us to. And that's what the statement would call us to consider. The Lamb of God. I want us to see, first of all, the prevalence of the Lamb. The prevalence of the Lamb. What do I mean by prevalence? I mean, in its frequency and its dominating theme throughout the Scripture. The Lamb being a key to the entire Scripture at least one of the main keys to the Scripture. And if you know your Bible, you will know this is the case. You will call to mind, for example, Genesis chapter 22, where we have Abraham and Isaac going up Mount Moriah, and there Abraham makes a declaration that in many ways is just like what John says. Because he turns around in Genesis 22 and verse 8 and says, God will provide himself a lamb. God will provide himself a lamb. He is looking to God to be the provider of one who would be a substitute. And of course, the imagery there of Genesis 22 is such a clear picture of the cross work of the Lord Jesus. And I would commend it 
as a study to you, if you do not know that portion of God's Word, to go and look there in Genesis 22 and see there what we might term the Lamb prophesied. Right there, in the life of Abraham, the father of the faithful, he has this experience that was to educate him and his children and his children's children right down through the generations to show that God would provide himself a lamb. And they turned, of course, and they beheld that lamb that God provided there by type. The ram caught in the thicket. We find not only the lamb prophesied, but the lamb typified. When we come to the book of Exodus, in the chapter 12, where we are taught about the Passover feast, the institution of this memorial as it was to be to the Jewish people. They are there in Egypt, in bondage, in captivity for over four centuries. They are no match to the Egyptians. They have no answer to their firepower. They have no way of escape, no way of defeating them, no way of setting themselves free from their bondage. And their cry goes up to God, and God hears their cry. And God is preparing a man, even way before the deliverance would ever come. You know, God, God works sometimes much slower than we would want them to, but He works, and His timing's always perfect. Right there with the birth of Moses, preserving this young man who then is in the sovereignty of God, brought up in Egypt so that he was trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He wasn't just to be some pauper, an Israelite who had no privilege to educate themselves in all the learning of that generation. He's taken to be educated to the highest possible way of that period and time and generation. And God sets him apart, preserves him, sends them off into the wilderness, brings them back at 80 years of age to lead the way of deliverance. And he becomes the, the spearhead to be that deliverer on behalf of the children of Israel. And there at the final plague of all that God is doing to humble the nation of Egypt, which never regained its power again. Historically, what God did to Egypt in the deliverance of His people crushed Egypt in a way in which they would never, ever recover. All their best sons, all their best soldiers, all their most equipped individuals, destroyed, wiped out, taken away by God. And we have the Passover instituted when we read in Exodus 12, verse 3, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. The children of Israel were to take a lamb and use that lamb as a type. It was to become a type of what it was they really needed, what they would find fulfilled in their Messiah. The lamb prophesied, typified, the lamb personified, this brings us into Isaiah chapter 53, a famous chapter where the mind boggles that the Jew cannot seem to see God's clear revelation of the person of Messiah and what he would endure, suffer, and experience. We read in verse 3 of that chapter through to verse 5, he is despised and rejected of men. Not to be a king who would lead his people, this is what they wanted to look for, wasn't it? A king to lead them politically and give them deliverance over the power and stranglehold of Rome. But he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. We see the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see him revealed in all that he would suffer and experience. The accuracy of this prophecy is, is amazing. 
And just how it details when you would imagine that the deliverer would be one who is depicted as an overcomer. And Christ was an overcomer. But in many ways, he came in weakness and in humility. And he, we see here, contrary to what we might imagine, him being despised, hated, being a man of sorrows, all these things showing that the Lamb was not exactly what we might imagine. We also have the Lamb identified here in this text in John 1, 29. John the Baptist identifies the Lamb. It's not any person, it's one person. It's not at any period, it's in one period. Here, as John is ministering, he cries to behold the Lamb of God. We have the Lamb crucified as well. You go through the Gospels, of course, every Gospel accounts the crucifixion. But turn with me to Acts chapter 8, where we see Philip ministering to the Ethiopian eunuch and presenting the Lamb crucified to him. Acts chapter 8, verse 32 Here the Ethiopian eunuch is reading through Isaiah. And Philip runs to meet with him, asks him the question, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Verse 32, The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb, Dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. We have here one led to die. The lamb crucified. And what then happens? Verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Who did Philip see there in Isaiah 53? Who did he see there in that language of being one led as a sheep to the slaughter? He sees Jesus. And this just underlines my point I made earlier. To see Jesus in the Scripture. And this was the ministry of Philip as he comes along. What is it the sinner needs to see? He needs to see Jesus. He needs to see the Lamb crucified. If you're here tonight without Christ, that's what you need to see. You've seen God perhaps in various ways, but you need to see God in Christ as the Lamb crucified. Unless you see that, you might never be saved. The Lamb glorified. We find in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, John says, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a Lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. He sees a vision. And in that vision, there's a lamb. A lamb that has been slain, but it lives and is in the midst of the throne. And so the lamb that has been slain is there living in the midst of the most glorified position, the most exalted position of heaven itself. The lamb glorified. Right through Scripture, we've gone from Genesis through Revelation, skipping through, seeing the prevalence of the lamb. This identity, this name, this title that we find John using here in John chapter 1, verse 29, isn't something he just plucked out of thin air. This is biblical language. This is scriptural teaching. This is central doctrine to the person of the Son of God, the prevalence of the Lamb. Secondly, I want us to notice the picture of the Lamb. The picture of the Lamb. And here, I want us to go back to what the type we highlighted in the Passover in Exodus chapter 12. Because this is one of the key image, images that were given in the Scripture with regard to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ as He would come here in Exodus chapter 12. And we're told very clearly by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. 
So we're not, we're not, I'm not making some kind of, of comparison here or connection that the Scripture doesn't reveal. It's not that I'm looking into Scripture and analogizing and things that, that aren't clearly depicted and revealed for us. The Spirit of God makes it clear that the Passover pointed to Christ and Paul says Christ is our Passover sacrificed for us. And so when we turn to Exodus 12, there are things for us to learn. First of all, when we picture the lamb here, we see a bloody sacrifice. A bloody sacrifice because that's what happened here with this lamb that was to be taken in order to give deliverance to the children of Israel. We see in this bloody sacrifice the blood shed in verse 22. Ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. So this is what you're to do. Blood that is in the basin. It's a, it's, there's blood being shed here. When they killed the lamb, when they, when they killed it, the, the blood was to be caught in a basin. And they took this blood. So it wasn't just blood being shed because it's not just that the blood was shed. I can tell you and proclaim to you that the blood upon Calvary's tree has been shed, but that doesn't bring salvation, does it? If I just tell you that it is an historical fact that Jesus Christ shed His blood on the cross, does that mean you're saved if you know that took place? No. So we not only have the blood shed, but we have the blood applied. It goes on in verse 22, doesn't it? And strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out at the door of his house until morning. You strike it upon the doorposts and the lentil, the same as given there in verse 7. They shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the houses wherein they shall eat it. So they take the blood. The blood is shed, but the blood needs to be applied. And I may be speaking to someone who has heard hundreds of sermons about the blood of Jesus Christ. And you're aware that Jesus shed His blood. And you understand why He shed His blood. You're not in any kind of confusion as to its purpose. But the blood has never been applied. The blood has never been applied. And if the blood has not been applied, you're not saved. If the children of Israel had taken that lamb and shed the blood and led, left that basin there full of blood and never applied it to the doorpost and the lentil, they would not have been delivered. They would have suffered the same death as the Egyptians. And does that not bring home a stark reality to those of you who may have been brought up in a Christian home? Unless the blood is applied to your heart, you're not in Christ. You're not saved. You are not going to be spared from the wrath of God. The blood has to be applied. It's not a matter that you say, well, I'm a Christian. I've always been a Christian. I've always believed these things. They could have taken that lamb and believed all that God would do. But if they hadn't obeyed God in the application of the blood, they would have suffered the same fate as the Egyptians. The blood shed, the blood applied, the blood accepted. It must be accepted as well. Here we see verse 13 of the same chapter. The blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So God accepts the blood. He recognizes the blood. And that's the only thing He recognizes and accepts. To be spared from judgment. The only way to be spared from judgment is through the blood. God does not recognize your good deeds. God does not recognize your church attendance. God does not recognize your prayerfulness or your Bible reading and Bible study. He doesn't recognize your, your desire to obey your parents and all oh, that has its place. Obeying parents and, 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 and living out your life correctly within the world, adhering to the law. 
prayer, Bible reading, going to church, those things are fine. There's a value in them, but not a saving value. It's not salvific. It doesn't bring you the certainty of deliverance from judgment. The blood is what God recognizes. The blood. The blood alone. It's a bloody sacrifice when we picture the lamb. But also, a blessed Savior when we picture the lamb. Because in Revelation chapter 7, and verses 9 and then 13 and 14, it tells us this, After this I beheld, and know a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. It goes on to say, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Those he beholds, the multitude of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, why are they there? Why are they before the throne, standing before the Lamb? They are there because they had their robes washed in the blood. I mean, it seems like a paradox, doesn't it? Because blood is one of the, the, the worst things for causing stains. But when it comes to the blood of Jesus Christ, it is the great stain extinguisher. It takes away the vile sins that have stained our lives and that uh, can never be blotted out by our own efforts. We can change our lives. We can make new resolutions. We can turn over a new leaf. We can transform the way we conduct our affairs. And we can, we can get some kind of deliverance from a past life of sinfulness. But that past life still haunts. Those sins still must be acquitted or dealt with some way. Either we pay the punishment ourselves or Christ pays them on our behalf. And the payment is seen in the blood. And these, this multitude, this huge host that John beholds from all the nations of the world, there's no difference whether they're Canadian or American or Indian or Pakistan or, or from, from wherever it is, the UK, it doesn't make a difference. He looks right across this, this great host. And he can see the differences lined up even right at the front. It's not like the white man standing at the front of the queue because he's higher or more important. No, he can see there. He can't see all behind the crowd. He can't see everyone. But he can see right that stand before the throne. He can see the differences, the variety of men and women who have come to know Christ and had their lives washed in the blood. That is the unifying factor. People say, well, those who have never heard the name of Jesus, will they be saved? And I remember someone asking me about this, wondering about this, when I was in Tasmania, thinking, surely God couldn't send people who have never heard the name of Jesus to hell. Surely there's a pardon there for them. And I said to them, you, you explain to me then what's the point in the Great Commission? What's the point? We might as well keep silence, say nothing. Because if they never hear the name of Jesus, then God will show them mercy. Don't tell them. Don't let them know. The Great Commission becomes counterproductive because as soon as I tell you, unless you obey, I've plunged you into certain damnation. Now you're hanging over hell. Whereas if I had just left you alone, there's going to be pardon and mercy for you. The Great Commission becomes counterproductive. No. We are to go out to the ends of the earth and God sends us messages his message, rather, through his messengers, and they proclaim one message wherever they go. That's why I don't need to be trained in the gospel in Canada. Might need, need to be trained in some other things. But not in the gospel. I don't need to somehow understand the particular nuances of, of Canadian people, maybe to some degree to relate to them. 
But I look down, no matter where I am in the world, I look upon the faces of condemned sinners, those without hope, and point them to the same message no matter where I go. Because they need the blood of Christ. And that is what unites this great host that John beholds in Revelation 7. They're all standing before a blessed Savior and the picture of the Lamb is one who has delivered by the shedding of His blood. It made them clean. It made their robes white and pure before the holiness of God. We're also given the picture of a burning sovereign in Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. A frightening passage. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said that the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The wrath of the Lamb? Have you ever seen the, la the wrath of a Lamb? You live in the city, maybe you don't see these things so often, I don't know. In comparison to this place, I'm a country boy. Um, to drive out and see lambs in spring is just, just part of life. You see them everywhere. You can't really take a journey anywhere without seeing lambs and, and cattle and, and whatever out in the fields. And when you walk into a farm or you walk into a certain a place where there may be farm animals, there are some animals you're, you're wary of. Certainly I am. I had a friend, I have a friend, and they used to have a goat. And I would get out of the car and get into the house as quickly as I could because goats are, you're wary of a goat. But a lamb, I never was frightened of a lamb. It's a little lamb. Who's, who's frightened of a lamb? And yet look at what the passage tells us. The wrath of the lamb. There's something there that we're to get a hold of, to meditate upon, to think about. Because the lamb is, the, the lamb is so peaceful and, and defenseless and apparently can't do anything to defend itself or to be any threat to anyone else. No one, nothing, is frightened of a lamb. But we're given the image of one who is frightful. One who is more ferocious than any lion. I mean, it would make more sense if it said, the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the lion of Judah. That would, that would make more sense to us, the ferocity of a, of a lion. But no, there's this theme of the lamb pictured for us, even when, with regard to the wrath of Christ. And that one who walked among men was so peaceful and, and, and brought peace and, and desired to reconcile men and, and bring them to a knowledge of the truth. There is coming a day when we cannot presume anymore upon his love kindness and mercy, He is going to meet our judgment more ferociously than we can ever imagine. So that the great men of the earth, the kings, the great men, rich men, chief captains, mighty men, who never feared anyone, are now fleeing from the presence of this Lamb and all of His wrath. trying to hide themselves. What are you hiding under? You maybe don't feel the fear at present. You're not afraid of the Lamb of God. Why should you be? And in a sense, you have no need to be afraid because at present, it's not the great day of His wrath. It's the great day of His mercy. And the Lamb offers mercy. He offers reconciliation. He offers redemption. He offers peace with God. He offers all the blessings of His salvation. But as a burning sovereign, and I say a burning sovereign because it's Him that sitteth on the throne. This Lamb with His wrath 
sitting upon the throne. He has all power. On that day, that power will be exercised in the damnation of those not washed in the blood. The picture of the Lamb. And thirdly, and finally, the promise of the Lamb. And this brings us into our text again. In John 1, 29. John is calling people to look upon Christ now. The time is coming for him to fade into the background and into the shadows to make way for the Lord Jesus Christ that people behold the Lamb of God. And you'll notice here the divine promise. Behold the Lamb of God. This whole text is a promise because what's it telling us? It will take away sin. But it's the Lamb of God. It's a divine promise because it's the Lamb of God. It, it comes from God. It is God. And God has provided the Lamb, as Abraham put it. God has provided the Lamb. This is God's answer for man's problem. This is God's solution for sin. This is what God points to if you want to know Him and be assured that you're right with God. This is the answer. No other answer. No confusion about this. It's a divine promise that says, the Lamb of God. It is to behold the Lamb of God. Not only a divine promise, but a distinct promise because it makes clear what He is there to do. To take away the sin of the world. Take away sin. A distinct promise. Not to bring you happiness. Though He does bring us joy. Not to bring you peace, though we do get His peace. Not to bring us all the blessings of life, though there are promised to us many blessings that He would, he would provide for us as we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. But that isn't the driving truth. That isn't what John is pointing to. That isn't the priority for men. The priority of men is their sin. How can I get the sin problem dealt with? It's not money problems or health problems or relationship problems. It's sin problems. And we need our sin dealt with. And here is the direction that we're pointed to, to behold the Lamb of God, because He is the appointed one to deal with sin. Not the church, not the preacher, not the creeds and confessions. It is the Lamb. It is the Lamb of God to deal with sin. There may be even in the words of John here as we bring this to a close, an anxiousness about how he presents the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, it makes a statement of introduction to him. Because I believe John felt strongly about making sure men and women are introduced to the Savior. He wasn't passive emotionally. I felt strongly that men should behold the Lamb to see Him so passionately that He repeats it, the same truth. Whenever we read there in verses 35 and 36, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. His two disciples are there but don't be my disciple. He could have followed him for a time, learning of him as he declared Christ, but now it's time for John to step back. So don't look at John. Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. Look to the Lamb. He re reiterates it because he's concerned that men would see him and know him. And that's how every preacher feels. That's how we ought to feel anyway. And there are times where within our hearts we our greatest burden at times is our lack of a burden. We sense it. We see in our own hearts a, a detachment from the reality of what men are facing. 
when they get mechanical about bringing the gospel to people. But we are to feel for them. I think John felt for them. This is why many believed in Christ through his testimony. This is why he had such an impact. Because he felt genuinely, and his concern was that men would behold the Lamb of God who was able to deal with their sin. And this is, this is my cry, this is my yearning, this is my mission, <laughs> that you behold the Lamb of God. Yes, to the people of God, that's always, I want you to see Him. I want you to always be falling in love more and more with Him, to enjoy every time of worship. But I think of these appointed times when my focus is also toward those of you who just aren't in Christ yet. You're not saved and you're, you're certainly not sure about it. My concern is there. My, I, I, I feel like John to some degree, though certainly to a lesser degree, that you must see the Lamb of God. You must behold Him savingly. Look upon Him. Believe on Him. Rest on Him. Put your trust in Him. There's no other answer. You will stand before God one day. Everyone will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We cannot avoid it, run from it. It is a reality we all must face. It may come to us, many of us, much sooner than we ever anticipate. And before we behold Him in judgment, we must behold Him in mercy. and Seek Him for what He offers, even the forgiveness of sins. This is your great need. The forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins. And the, the, the joy of my, of my ministry is the confidence I have to tell you that this is a watertight message. Just like it was for John. It wasn't that he may deal with your sin or will deal with some of your sin. No. Deals with sin. This is the solution. Doesn't need anything added to it. Don't take anything away from it. The Lamb of God is the answer for sin. The Lamb of God is the answer for sin. Your sin. All sin. Anyone's sin. The answer is the Lamb of God. And so all I do is point you to Him. I ask you if you have any concern to make it known to us tonight that I may sit down with you and just point you to this one, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Let's bow together in prayer.